Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering anorexia nervosa. Now, before we even get started, guys, go ahead and like this video. You know you're going to like the video. Press the red notification button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, let's get started. So anorexia nervosa, look at what it says. It says individuals with anorexia nervosa refuse to maintain a minimally normal weight for the height and express intense fear of gaining weight. That's what it is. They refuse to eat enough to actually maintain what should be their weight for their height, for their age. Recovery is evaluated as a stage in the process rather than a fixed event. Let's stop right there. What is that telling us? That is telling us just like, you know, if someone is an alcoholic, right, and they go to rehab, they still consider themselves an alcoholic until they die because there's still that addiction. Same thing. That's what they're saying here. Recovery is evaluated as a stage in process rather than a fixed event. So it's not like the person can say, oh, um, that's in the past, uh, anorexia, anorexia will never happen again. This is going to be a struggle for many, many, many patients that is uh, lifelong. And I'm going to go into the reasons that um, patients tend to struggle with anorexia, how this even becomes a diagnosis. Let's keep going. Factors that influence the stage of recovery include the percentage of ideal body weight that's been achieved, how much weight have they gained towards the goal of what you know they should weigh? The extent to which self-worth is defined by shape and weight and the amount of disruption existing in the patient's personal life. All of that is going to have effect on that patient reaching the goal of reaching the minimum, the minimum weight needed to maintain themselves or if they revert back to not eating. The patient will require, look what this says, long-term treatment, just like um, alcohol addiction, just like substance addiction. This is going to be a lifelong process. That is something very important for you guys to know about anorexia. All right, comorbidity. What kind of disorders or diseases do we often see with the patient that's anorexic? Bipolar. You know bipolar disorder, that's when the patient may have a manic phase where they have that high, they're going, 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 or depressive phase where they have that extreme sadness. They're so sad they can't even move. Depression, what is the um, depressive of the bipolar state, but also depression, what is depression, guys? Depression is anger, anxiety, hostility, turn towards self. And anxiety disorders commonly occur with anorexia nervosa. So we may see this patient at the extremes of the spectrum where they're in the manic phase, they're happy all the time and they can't stop. They're just going to the other end of the spectrum where they're so sad and depressed that they can't even move to having anxiety and they can have anxiety to the point where they can't function, okay? Risk factors, you guys can read all of this, but I'll tell you one of the most important risk factor right there, heredity. Look at this. It says a review of relevant studies suggests that heritability of anorexia nervosa is 60%. So we know that genetics is a huge risk factor. Let's let me try to move this down. You know, I'm using my broken camera. I travel all over the place, guys. I do these speaking engagements. So I have my camera with me and I'm just too lazy to get it out the car. So I'm using the broke one. All right, look at this. Box 18.1 characteristics of um, eating problems. We're touching on anorexia today. So intense fear of gaining weight having the distorted body image. So this patient may be well below the BMI, but when they look at themselves in the mirror, they see that they're fat. Restricted calories with significantly low BMI. And then look at the subtypes. We have the restricting where um, they have uh, no consistent bulimic features. And 
I'm not going to talk about bulimia today, but I'm just going to explain it so you guys can understand this. With bulimia, you have the patient where they'll um, binge, they'll eat, 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 then they'll feel guilty about all the food that they ate and then they'll purge, okay? So that's what they mean when they say restricting no consistent bulimic features because the patients, you see how with anorexia, the patient's gonna be severely underweight. With bulimia, the patient is usually around the BMI that they should be, or they might be a little bit overweight or a little bit under, but they won't be severely underweight the way we see it in anorexia. Binge eating, purging type, this is primarily restriction, some bulimic behavior. So that's very important for you guys to understand because you have to be able to differentiate between anorexia where that patient's not eating and the little bit that they do eat, they try to purge. They'll either go on the um, treadmill and try to run real fast to burn off those calories or they'll try to take laxatives where the patient with bulimia who normally is around their target weight, they'll purge, they'll eat, 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 and then feel so guilty about all that food that they ate. No, purges to get rid of. What was I trying to say? Purges to get rid of. With bulimia, I can't think of the word, but they'll eat, 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 and then they feel guilty about all that food that they ate, and then they'll try to purge. They'll either take some laxatives or they'll stick their finger down the throat and make themselves vomit, okay? So anyway, Thoughts and behaviors associated with anorexia nervosa. Now, right before I get into this box, let me explain something to you. Anorexia, we tend to see them more in girls and boys. And we tend to see a family dynamic specifically between the mother and the daughter. So we tend to see that the mother's pushing the daughter to be the captain of the cheerleading team, to be the president of student council, to be this, to be that, to have these grades, to go to this college, to have this boyfriend. And the daughter feels that she has no control over her life. Her whole life has been planned out, but the only thing that she can control is her mouth. She can control herself. So she doesn't eat. When you see anorexia, most often anorexia is the the the, the root issue, guys, is not hunger or eating. The root issue is control. This person feels like their life is spinning out of control and they have no control over anything except for their body. And so they decide that's how they're going to gain some kind of control. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we go over these. So thoughts and behaviors associated with anorexia. Oh, I'm sorry, guys, my fingers are wrong place. All right, so let's start with this terror of gaining weight. That terror of gaining weight, guys, the fear really comes from losing control. They're so afraid that they'll lose control because remember their body's the only thing that they have left to have control over. So they are absolutely terrified of um, gaining weight. They have preoccupation with thoughts of food, view self of fat, even when they're emaciated. What does that word emaciated mean? That means wasting away. So even when you could see the bones on them, right? To them, they're fat. Peculiar handling of food, such, in, such as cutting foods into small bites. They're trying to delay that eating. So you go out to lunch with your friend and you're eating your food and you notice they cut their piece of meat into 50 million pieces and they didn't take not one bite yet. Okay, that's that preoccupation that they have. Pushing pieces of food around the plate, that's another way that they avoid having to eat because they want the socialization, but not the eating part. Uh, possible development of rigorous exercise regimen. Why? Because of the little bit of food that they do eat, they wanna burn off those calories. They don't wanna gain not one pound. Possible self-induced vomiting, use of laxatives and diuretics. They're gonna do anything that they can to stay skinny. Cognition so disturbed, let's stop right here. What does cognition mean? That means thought process. So their thought process is so disturbed that they the, that individual judges their self-worth by his or her weight. Because they put so much work in controlling their body, now they've attached it, that control to their self-worth. All right, let's move on. Possible signs and symptoms of anorexia nervosa. 
Um, I underlined the signs and symptoms that tend to show up the most for testing. I don't write your exam, so I don't know what you're going to have. Make sure you know all of it. However, if I were you, I would start with the ones that I underlined first. Okay, so what are those signs and symptoms? Obviously, weight loss. How? Restricting calories, excessive exercise. Another sign and symptom, amenorrhea. Why? Because they've lost so much weight. Remember, your body tries to survive no matter what, right? So when you get to the point that you're severely underweight, your um, menses, if, if um, um, you're a female, can stop. And you see that in a lot of young athletes that train vigorously, such as gymnasts, okay? You'll see that they don't have um, menses anymore. Lanugo, Lanugo, you'll learn more about that when you guys get into peds, but that is the very soft, fine hair that they'll have on um, growing out of their body. The hair is very soft, very fine, and that comes from starvation. Constipation. Well, aren't you constipated when you don't eat? Yeah. So we tend to see them constipated. Impaired renal function. Whenever anything is severely wrong with your body, what is the first organ to shut down on you or start shutting down? Your kidneys. Because your body's meant to survive no matter what. So whenever your body's in trouble, your kidney says, uh-oh, I don't know what's going on, but whatever minerals and nutrients that I have left, I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let it go in the urine. And so you see the urine output go down and the BUN and creatinine start to creep up. So we see impaired renal function that's stemming from that um, um, electrolyte imbalance. Hypokalemia. Your potassium is supposed to be 3.5 to 5. And you'll see that patient being hypokalemic because they're not eating any foods that have potassium in it. They're not eating anything, period. And degree, um, decreased bone, bone density. They're not eating foods that have calcium. Heck, they're not eating at all. So there's no calcium going into the bones. The bones get weaker and you'll see decreased bone density. What did I write over here on the side? Oh, okay. For... For the yellow skin, the cause is hyperkeratonemia. And what I wrote here in parentheses, this comes from um, keratin rich foods such as carrot, squash, sweet potato. Okay, so I put that in the note. So I don't forget to tell you guys about that. All right, let's talk about general assessment. The patient with the restricting type of anorexia, that's the one where they just don't eat anything, will be severely underweight. Guys, the author could have just wrote underweight. What did I tell you about that word severely? When you see that word severely, stop and pay attention. There's a reason that they put that adjective before that noun. Is underweight a noun? Yeah. Person, place, or thing? Yes. Okay. They're describing it severely underweight. Look, and may have growth of fine downy hair known as the nugo on the face and back. So in the text, they told us about Lanugo, and then the author took the time to talk about it here in this table as well. Don't you think that's important to know? Didn't I tell you whenever the author's repeating information, most likely that's going to be a test question for you? There's a reason they're repeating this information. They can have mottled, cool skin on the extremities and low blood pressure. They're not drinking. So you need fluid, right, to increase your pressure. Pulse and temperature readings consider uh, consistent with a malnourished dehydrated state. Look at this, guys. Perfectionism, obsessive thoughts and actions related to food, intense feelings of shame, people pleasing, and the need to have complete entire control over their therapy pose additional challenges. Because in anorexia, the root problem is not even about food. It's about control, them trying to maintain control at all costs. So the reason it's so challenging to care for these type of patients is, excuse me, when they come um, in house and we're trying to treat them, they're even trying to control their therapy session, which can be very frustrating. When patients appear to be resistant to change, 
it's helpful to acknowledge the constant struggle that so characterizes the treatment. You may wanna to say to that patient, it must be very hard to always have the need to control. It must be very challenging. It must be very tiresome. And just you making that observation, making that statement, the patient may say, yeah, I can't even help it, but it's very tiresome. And you open up a dialogue where you can have therapeutic communication. So let's talk about the diagnosis. Imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements is usually the what? Ding, ding, ding. Priority nursing diagnosis for individuals with anorexia. When it comes to anorexia, before we're concerned about their feelings, before we're concerned about teaching, heck, before we even concerned about um, other things that we normally consider to be physiologic integrity, such as, you know, uh, um, what's the example I'd like to give? Blood pressure. Unless that blood pressure is severely out of range, this is going to be our priority, imbalanced nutrition. Why? Because that's what's killing the patient. That is what will kill the patient the fastest when it comes to anorexia. So our goal is to get those nutrients into the patient. Nutrition, that is our primary goal when it comes to the anorexic patient. Other nursing diagnoses include decreased cardiac output. Nothing's going in, nothing's going to come out. Risk for injury. Remember, they have electrolyte imbalance. They might get dizzy, fall, pass out. Risk for imbalanced fluid of volume. They're not taking anything into their body. And last time I checked, fluid and electrolytes was part of physiological integrities, just like nutrition. Disturbed body image. Remember, they'll look in the mirror and they'll be emaciated, but they think they're fat. Ineffective coping. Um, this disease gets worse during times of stress when they feel like they're really losing control. Chronic low self-esteem and powerlessness. That is the whole issue with anorexia. Assessment guidelines. I'm not going to read all of these, but something very important, assess nutritional pattern and fluid intake. Why? Because that's going to be our priority, getting food and fluid into the patient. Something else let me mention that you're going to want to do is the lab testing. You're going to want to see what their electrolyte levels look like. So that way we can know what we're going to be giving the patient, the glucose levels, thyroid function tests, because yes, that patient may have anorexia, but what if they have hyperthyroidism, which only aids to the problem? We want to do a complete blood count, including the hematocrit and hemoglobin, and of course, ECG, because we are concerned about the cardiac function or dysfunction because of what? The fluid electrolyte imbalance. The most important outcome is attainment of a safe weight. When it comes to anorexia, what is going to be your goal, your number one priority? Nutrition. We want to get them to a safe weight because if we don't, what's going to happen? Their organs are going to start to fail and they'll die. Eventually, that's what's going to happen and we're trying to prevent it. So planning. Planning depends on the acuity of the patient's situation, how bad that situation is, how emergent that situation is. That's how we're going to plan. When a patient with anorexia is experiencing extreme electrolyte imbalance or weighs below 75% of the ideal body weight, the plan is to immediately um, uh, hospitalize them. They're going to be inpatient. Why? We don't have time to spare for that patient to be outpatient or for us to be working with them. They're in immediate danger. They can die. We need to get IVs going into that patient. We need to get fluid and electrolytes and nutrition and minerals into that patient ASAP. Look at this. In severely malnourished patients, a refeeding syndrome may occur. What's a refeeding syndrome? I'm glad you asked. This is a potentially lethal treatment complication that may result in fluid balance abnormalities, abnormal glucose metabolism, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia. Basically what happens is that body has been in starvation mode for so long. If you feed them too fast, all of this can happen. 
Okay, so look, reintroduction of nutrients must proceed how? Slowly to avoid this. So yes, we want that patient to get the normal body weight, the ideal body weight, absolutely. But we have to refeed them slowly if this patient has been severely malnourished. If we give them food too fast, they can have refeeding syndrome. Make sure you guys know these. Usually they um, show up as select all that applies. Don't say I didn't warn you. Let's take a look at this table, signs and symptoms, and the nursing diagnoses for them. So signs and symptoms, patients wasting away. They're emaciated. They're dehydrated. They're having um, arrhythmias, inadequate intake, dry skin, decreased blood pressure, decreased uh, urine output, increased urine concentration, weakness. Look at all these diagnoses that you can have for this patient. But number one is going to be what? Imbalanced nutrition. How many times have we seen this? Number one, imbalanced nutrition. Aside from imbalanced nutrition, they can have decreased cardiac output because they didn't have input to begin with. They can have risk for injury because they're missing all those electrolytes that can um, cause them to have a fall or injure themselves. Risk for imbalanced uh, fluid volume, disturbed body image. And disturbed body image, guys, this is very important with the disturbed body image. That's when they're constantly looking at themselves in the mirror. They're constantly calling themselves fat. That does have to be addressed, but that never takes priority over nutrition because who cares how they think about their body if they're dead or if their kidneys are shutting down, okay? If we see the patient having destructive behavior towards themselves, they're having poor concentration, inability to meet role expectations, inadequate problem solving, your nursing diagnosis for that will be ineffective coping. What if they can't make decisions? Indecisive behavior, something as simple as if they want jello or cookie and they can't make a decision. Indecisive behavior, lack of eye contact. Passive reports, feelings of shame. We, um, when I, let's back up because I want to explain this to you. Passive. So instead of making a decision, they just say, oh, you make the decision for me. Okay. Passive reports, feeling of shame, rejects positive feedback about self. You tell the patient, you know, you're very smart. And they say, no, I'm not. I'm a dummy. What's your nursing diagnosis? Chronic low self-esteem. Outcomes, you see a whole bunch of outcomes, but I'm only going to go over this one with you. You guys can read the rest. Look at this. Nutrients are ingested and absorbed to meet metabolic needs. That is our number one priority, nutrition. I cannot stress that enough. Implementation for acute care. So we have an acute situation going on. As patients begin to refeed, they ideally participate in the unit's milieu. In this setting, the patient should feel accepted and safe from judgmental evaluations. The focus should be on the eating behavior and the underlying feelings of anxiety, dysphoria, low self-esteem, and lack of control instead of making comments about their weight. You see the difference? Because at the end of the day, guys, remember the under, underlying cause is that sense of control that they need to have and that feeling of anxiety that they have whenever they're anywhere near food or they think they're going to have to eat or they think they might gain an ounce. Look at this. Close monitoring of patients includes all. What did I tell you about all inclusive words? All, always, only, never pay attention. All trips to the bathroom after eating to prevent self-induced vomiting. You going to a bathroom, I'm going to. Because they will eat and then excuse themselves and then try to purge. Patients may also need monitoring on bathroom trips after seeing visitors and after any hospital pass to uh, ensure they have not had access to and ingested any laxatives or diuretics. If you know the patient's been doing really well and they get a day pass, on that day pass, they might get their hands on some diuretics or some laxatives so they can try to lose that weight that they gain. So whenever, um, by the way, whenever they come from visitation, you absolutely do have to check their belongings.
All right, this is a case study about patient with anorexia. I'm not reading all of that. Let's just get down to short-term goals, nursing interventions, and rationales for them. So short-term goal, patient's going to gain weight. We want them to gain a minimum of two pounds and a maximum of three pounds every week. Why? Our number one priority is what? nutrition. So what is our intervention going to be for this patient? We're going to acknowledge the emotional and physical difficulty the patient's experiencing. Well, Professor D, we just saw that a couple pages ago. Now we're seeing again, yeah, that's going to be a test question. You need to know that. Before you can help them, you have to acknowledge how hard this has to be for them. Okay? You're going to weigh them daily for the first week. Why? Our priority is nutrition. I can't stress this enough, guys, because that weight is going to tell us if our plan is, be, is effective or if we have to reevaluate that plan. So we're going to weigh them every day for the first week, then three times a week. Why? Because um, as that patient gains weight, right? We want to move that focus off the weight because we really want them focusing on the behavior behind them not eating. So the first week, we're going to weigh them every day. Then we're going to go to three times a week. Do not negotiate weight with patient or reweigh. That's a way that they try to keep control. So you put them on the scale and the scale says 112. And they're like, no, 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 no. Let me take off my sweater. No, 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 no. Reweigh me. Number one. They're trying to focus on the weight and we don't want them focusing on the weight. We want them to focus on the underlying cause of them not wanting to gain weight. That's number one. And number two, they're still trying to control the situation. Do not negotiate. That number is that number. No, we are not reweighing you until your next weigh-in. Measure vital signs three times a day until stable because remember this patient that's severely underweight, they're at risk for hypotensive crisis, they're at risk for cardiac dysrhythmias, lots of things, right? So we're gonna be um, taking their vital signs three times a day until they're stable and then daily. You wanna provide a pleasant, calm atmosphere at mealtimes. Why? Their anxiety is going to be through the roof every time they have to eat. So you need to make that, um, experience as enjoyable as possible. Decrease their anxiety. Look at this. I put a star next to this. This one's on NCLEX, by the way. Or it's been seen on NCLEX, I should say. Observe patient during meals to prevent hiding or throwing away a food and for at least one hour after eating to prevent purging because they'll pretend to eat and pocket the food in their cheek until they can go to the bathroom or find a garbage and spit it out. So you need to observe them while they're eating and then follow them. Stay with them for at least an hour after they ate so that they don't try to go to the bathroom and just throw up. Be empathetic with the patient's struggle to give up control of eating and weight as she's expected to make minimum weight gain on a regular basis. That is saying the same thing as letting the patient know that you understand how hard it is for them, okay? You think they're going to enjoy those weigh-ins and see that the weight is going up, even though that's what's keeping them alive. To them, it's devastating. So you have to be empathetic about that. Monitor their weight gain. Again, a weight gain of two to three pounds per week is medically acceptable. That is the second time we've seen this. As the patient approaches her target weight, there should be encouragement to make her own choices for menu selection. Why? Remember, this whole issue is control. So as she starts to gain weight, start to give her more control over the menu and control over things that she wants to eat, because now we're shifting that focus in a healthy way. Oh, and that's the last one. Um, next is bulimia. So guys, 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 I can't speak. This was anorexia nervosa in a nutshell. Not that hard, right? So I'm going to make sure the next video when it comes to the site that I cover for you will be bulimia. And I'll go back and forth to remind you of the differences between anorexia nervosa and bulimia, because for testing purposes, you're expected to know the differences. You're expected to know the difference in the signs and symptoms, especially the nursing interventions. 
patient teaching. So guys, this was anorexia. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments. If there's anything you'd like to see me cover that I haven't done so already, let me know. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out my audio lessons, guys. If you have a test coming up and you really need your grade to go up by a letter or two, my audio lessons is where it's at. I keep trying to tell you, nobody wants to listen. Check it out. Nexusnursinginstitute.com. You can check me out on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will see me on the next video.